Hello and welcome to West Wind, an audio podcast about cancer, technology and medicine, and policy issues. I'm host and medical oncologist, Dr. Jack West, from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. You can find West Wind material at beaconmedic, one word, dot com, at iTunes, or just about anywhere you get podcast content. I would just ask that you show your interest and support by subscribing, commenting, sharing by telling friends and colleagues in person and on social media, and rating it however you feel is appropriate. You can also share your ideas and opinions by emailing us at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. I'm uh, very happy to be joined today by Dr. Jarushka Naidu, who is an assistant professor of oncology at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center and Bloomberg Kimmel Center for Cancer Immunotherapy at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Jarushka, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Jack. Thank you so much for asking me. I know we're going to have a lot to cover because you have a a path that is really remarkable, especially for someone who is still a young rising star in, in the field. I know you grew up in South Africa. Were you born there? Can you tell us about your, your childhood? Yes, sure. So, yes, I'm a proud South African, born and raised in, in Durban. So, ethnically, I am Indian, but from a national perspective, I, I'm a South African. So uh, South Africa actually has the largest population of Indian people outside of India. There are almost 8 million of us um, and mainly centered in a province called KwaZulu-Natal, which is where historically many of the sugarcane plantations are located. And historically, Indian people came over as sugarcane farmers in the 18 and 1900s. So that's kind of where our culture stemmed from. So I, I'm born and raised there and lived there till I was 18 until I won a scholarship to go to medical school in Ireland. And uh, that's where I lived from uh, the age of 18 until 30. Uh, so I did all of my medical school training and my postgraduate training in medicine and in oncology in Ireland, after then getting a scholarship from the Irish government to complete my final training in the United States. That's quite a, a rich story. I don't want to pass over too much because I know that before you were in Dublin, you were working as a TV personality. Is that right? So, yes, that's that's an interesting part of my life. So when growing up in South Africa, I was, I suppose, what you would call a renaissance woman from a very early age. Um, I always had a very number of interests, including not just medicine and biology. So biology was by far my favorite um, subject at school, but sort of a close tie with biology was, was speech and drama. So uh, I was one of those people that was on the stage from the age of five, um, tormenting my parents and friends with various performances. And um, and then when I was 12, I was um, the South African Broadcasting Company, which is sort of our foremost um, television set of television channels in South Africa, came to our school, which was sort of known as a, uh, an, an all-girls private grooming kind of a school. Um, came to sort of interview us and see if there were any potential um, rising talents for TV presenting. And through that avenue, I, um, I began a career as a television presenter from the age of around 12 or 13 and kept going with that until I was nearly 16 or 17. Um, so that was an interesting part of my life and I think has really developed a lot of my interests in terms of communication, um, imparting knowledge, imparting a message, um, what it means to be a good communicator. Um, so that, that's a very you know, interesting part of my life that I'm very much proud of and something I think continues in my oncology career. Did you envision potentially working in television drama you know i know you also had training in stage work and and shakespeare even after and we'll talk about that but did you have some idea that you might not go into medicine or did you have an idea at 12 that you would want to be intermingling medicine and your dramatic interests 
So I never really thought that I would be an academic um, or someone who, who would do something like medicine. So my mother um, is a professor of radiology. Um, my brother wanted to be a doctor, um, but I was sort of the, the young flighty one who wanted to do something like medicine, who wanted to do something like drama. So I always thought I would be an actress or a journalist. Um, but actually, it was my, my private school upbringing. I think when you do well at school, particularly in a, a country like South Africa, where you have to work hard and be smart to get by, um, I would say my teachers weren't entirely supportive of a career in acting for a straight A student. So um, when I sort of said I wanted to be an actress, everybody balked um, and, and wasn't happy with that. So in the middle of all of this, I think I developed both my acting career and my academic abilities, and I found a career path that was somewhere in the middle. Mm. Now, can you talk about what it was like Growing up Indian in South Africa, I think South African racial politics and social issues have evolved over decades. And of course, it's a global issue, but uh, at least you experienced it in one place that I think was a bit of a crucible for race relations. And I'm not sure what it's like, you know, to be non white Indian. And, you know, you were. You said in a, I believe, a private school that was you know, all girls. So what was it like from where you were growing up? Yeah, I think I had a very unique upbringing in South Africa that is quite different to a, a typical South African, although I don't even know how you define a typical South African. You know, South Africa is a, very, a culture very rich in diversity. We have 11 official languages um, and really lots of different ethnicities could be encapsulated within the definition of South African. I think from uh, an Indian standpoint, my influences and trajectory is unique in the sense that, so my mother and um, my family, obviously the generation ahead of me grew up during the apartheid era and I was born in the apartheid era. I was born in 1982. So Mandela had not been released from prison at that stage. Um, my mother trained so Ireland used to train South Africa's non-white people as a stand against apartheid. So you will notice that actually many of our South African cabinet ministers and um, higher level professionals have received their training in countries such as Ireland and Scotland. So my mother was actually the first Indian radiologist, female radiologist in South Africa um, and trained in Ireland in the 70s. So um, when she came back to South Africa in the 80s uh, to try and be with her family and develop her career, it was a new world to have people like her who were educated, non-white females. So one of the areas that she could get work in was the private sector. And at that time, a couple of schools, private schools were also allowing non-white children in as a sort of passive stand against apartheid. And I was one of those children. So I was one of the, the first Indian children, and there were some um, African children as well who were allowed into this, um, to be honest, fairly posh, um, all girls uh, Anglican school in Durban called Durban Girls College. So, and really that was a, a massive boost forward for me in my life to receive really an exemplary education from the age of five right up until 18, I stayed in the same school. And um, through that schooling, I was able to do an international examination that allowed me to get my scholarship for medicine. Um, and that really is a unique path that I know many South Africans did not have an opportunity to um, avail of. And I think it's directly related to my mother, directly related to the school opportunity uh, to the Times, and of course, again, to Ireland. So I'm very grateful for all of that. Excellent. Did you, in that time that you were in your schooling in South Africa, feel any sense of otherness? Or was it such a diverse student community or entire community that you saw and lived with that you did not feel any sense of being outside of, of any predominant group? 
I think that where I went to school was a very unique and safe haven for diversity, but there was quite a disconnect, I think, between the academic forward thinking of being in an educational environment such as the school I went to and the concurrent social environment and climate of the country. So I think when you entered the gates of school, you were in a, a safe place. Everybody received the same education and was seen equally, but that wasn't the case when you stepped out of school. And that was quite obvious. So I think even though I made friends um, and had an excellent education and an equitable education, I did not feel that equity when I left school. So many of the, the girls I went to school with would have socialized in ways that I couldn't socialize. Um, you know, it became very obvious to me, I suppose, when I was a teenager and they were very much you know, white things to do and non-white things to do. And I think that's very true of many cultures and many countries that undergo an upheaval like this, that there is a social lag time between the equality you may notice in an academic center versus the equality you may notice in a social sector. But I think that that is something that has really come on in leaps and bounds in the last number of years. I still go home to South Africa and I still call it home. Um, I still go back probably once a year. And I would say that the the social aspect of things has definitely caught up. You know, you see interracial couples now, um, you see people mingling of all different um, race and ethnic groups in the same areas or same localities. And that really was not something that I would have seen in my teenage years. Did uh, you grow up with an expectation that you would marry an Indian guy and uh, have a, a strong Indian culture in your own home? Or was South Africa and your family's internationality such that there was not any expectation and it was just whoever you might prefer or, or just no sense of any expectations at all? So... I think obviously my family was used to swimming upstream. So um, my mother, when she was in Ireland, uh, had dated an, an Irish uh, fella for many, many years, for nearly 20 years, but came home and, and married a South African Indian man. Um, and I think probably the social focus wasn't really clearly articulated for me. I think my parents were, you know, a, a marginalized group growing up in a marginalized society, um, the focus was on doing well at school, having a good life, and um, and the social stuff came second. So um, I, I am now married to an Irish man. Um, I met him during my training, and this is certainly something I didn't receive any pushback from my family about, um, but I think it's probably related to um, my fairly unique upbringing. Excellent. So let's talk about, you had mentioned the connection of Ireland and South African non-whites. Did you have an expectation or a hope that your education and life would logically progress from growing up and having your early schooling in South Africa to then going to Ireland? Or was this just an opportunity based on a test and a unique opportunity? Yes. So I think, as I mentioned, I don't think I ever imagined that I would become a doctor. So when I was young, uh, as a teenager, I, I was very much focused on being an actress or being a journalist. And then unfortunately, when I was 13, around the time that Mandela was released from prison, there was a lot of political upheaval in the country, a lot of senseless crimes and senseless violence, which obviously my family were, were not directly or, or even indirectly involved in. But through that, my, um, my brother was actually shot in, um, oh, in an accident. I'm sorry. And, uh, and he's the one who always wanted to be a doctor, not me. Um, but all of a sudden, the roles sort of switched. And as the only child, and the only child who is also getting straight A's, um, it became a logical progression to try to pursue multiple dreams. So I became a doctor and an actress. And I think a, a doctor in a field where there is a lot of um, communication, um, a lot of presentations, um, and I feel that really a lot of my skill sets are serviced by this career path. 
And while you were in Dublin, you did continue to do stage acting. And can you talk about what it was like to be studying the science and medicine that you did as part of your requirements and presumably interest, but also having a largely non-overlapping set of interests and training in stage acting and Shakespeare and, and all the work that you were doing, I believe, concurrently. Can you talk about what that was like? Yeah, so um, so when I basically when I finished um, school, uh, I got into medical school in in South Africa. But I I knew it deep down that I could never be a, a doctor in the South African sense or to service the needs of what the country needed at the time. For example, to be a surgeon or a pediatrician or an ER physician, which is really what the country needed. I I wanted to be someone who who knew a lot about biology and. Um, studied why cancer happens or complex treatments. And from from that sort of early age, I knew that I wanted to be more of an academic type of doctor. So I thought that that being somewhere like Ireland would probably service that a little bit better. But I had the concurrent love of acting um, and theater and communication at the same time. So I decided, of course, to go to Trinity College in Dublin, which um, is a university with an unbelievably rich um, history of literature. You know, it's a it's where Samuel Beckett went to went to college, and their theatre is the Samuel Beckett Theatre. So I I joined the drama club, and then I found an amateur drama group called the Bellali Players. And um, you know, I continued this idea of being a Renaissance woman. You know, during the day, I I went to college, I did my medicine, I studied hard, and then in the afternoons and the evenings, I I had my little bit of escapism on the stage. And I, you know, to this day, I don't really understand why any of us would want to be a one trick pony. I'm, I, I've always been someone who has enjoyed a variety of skill sets and, and mastering a variety of skill sets. I suppose I'm a, a classical extrovert, you would say. So, um, so yes, I think actually I found these two skills and interests symbiotic rather than at odds with each other. I thought developing both interests at the same time actually strengthened and encouraged them both. Um, and then I, I finished medicine and felt that I had given, you know, so much of my life and so much of my time to to developing this, this skill set and becoming a doctor. But really, the acting had taken a sort of second seat. And I wanted to give it that time. And that's when I auditioned to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London to do Shakespearean acting for the stage. And I, I did that because I thought, well, what... What is more pure than Shakespeare on the stage in terms of acting? So, so I took a year off after after I finished college, after my intern year. So Ireland, you know, having trained in Ireland, there was this opportunity to take a couple of years off, travel the world, and they would keep your training position, your residency uh, position in medicine. So I decided to do that, and I, I went off and I did Shakespeare, um, in London, and that was really, a, again, a very enriching experience. But actually, ironically, it highlighted to me that I actually also really wanted to be a doctor. And I think the reason for that was I think somewhere along the way, I had realized it wasn't just about, you know, your individual skills or your individual interests, but it was about finding a community of like-minded people not just, you know, colleagues, but also patients and people you would be interacting with. And I found that in medicine. I found that people thought like me and and had similar interests to me. And these were the people that I wanted to grow with. Whereas <laughs> the traumatic folks in London were a, a very different breed. And while I, I really enjoyed some of that, I, I got a deep sense that these were not my people. Um, and while I loved acting and, and I definitely loved the amateur drama and those types of things in, in Dublin, the, the real bona fide Shakespeare for the stage was something I loved probably by myself, but some of the other, the other illnesses that attend it would probably not be what I would want for the future. It's interesting. I do think that a significant part of how we end up finding the medical specialty that we end up 
deciding to do is how well we resonate with the people in the field. And uh, obviously, drama, Shakespearean drama versus medicine is an extreme version, but at least it's interesting hearing you talk about how finding your people and who are not your people help define your ultimate decisions in a career path. So interesting stuff. I'd like to turn to, you had mentioned that there was some connection that led you to the U.S. for additional training. And I'd like to learn more about whether you had considered staying in Dublin or in the U.K. in general, or whether you had sites on the U.S. all the time, and whether there was a specific need to do additional training. You did a, a fellowship, I believe, in in Ireland, and then an advanced fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So can you tell us about what led you down that path? Yes, sure. So I think in finding one's community, obviously, central members of that community are the mentors that you find along the way. So in Ireland, my first rotation as a medical student was in medical oncology. Um, and that was with a, um, a professor um, called John Kennedy, who was at Hopkins for 10 years. Um, and what drew me to oncology um, was really the variety and, you know, the, the variety of skill sets and interactions that we have and the different skill sets that we need to master to be an oncologist. It just became obvious to me very early on that, you know, a cardiologist does the heart, a gastroenterologist does, does the gut, but, but we have to understand so many different pieces of the puzzle to put them together and to coordinate the care of a patient and uh, to communicate that complexity to a patient. So I was sold in oncology really from the get-go. And um, Professor Kennedy said to me, um, well, if you're going to do oncology, the only place to do it is the United States. And the only place to do it is Johns Hopkins, which is kind of ironic in terms of how things turned out. Um, so I laughed and, and filed that at the back of my brain and had always thought to myself the U.S. would be intriguing Actually, from a, dr a drama perspective, obviously, this is where so much of our influences come in terms of acting and the creative arts. That was always in my head from when I was young, but I, I never thought that my acting would lead me to the U.S. And then this was the first sort of inkling that I had heard about in terms of going to the U.S. for oncology. So influenced by Professor Kennedy, I actually did my USMLEs during my medical school training with the idea that at some point I may go to the U.S. to pursue my oncology training. But then while I was doing my residency, I met my husband, who is Irish, and we got married. And the training scheme in, in Ireland for oncology is excellent. So I pursued that. But actually, it's interesting, there are a very small number of medical oncologists in Ireland in the region of about 40 to 50 oncologists for the whole country. And all of them have received some level of uh, subspecialist training in uh, regions outside of Ireland just you know, to allow for the development of a subspecialist skill set. So, so most of the oncologists train in the, trained in the U.S. during their training and some trained in the United Kingdom and London and other places. So influenced by Professor Kennedy, I had thought in my mind that I would probably apply for internal medicine residency in oncology in the U.S., but that path was sort of derailed by by meeting an Irishman and, and, and sort of saying, I'm going to stay in Ireland. But then the, the question of America came up again when I was completing my, my fellowship training in oncology in Ireland. And there was an opportunity through the Irish Society of Medical Oncology, which is sort of like a, um, the equivalent of a, a small ASCO in Ireland, where they had a scholarship program where one Irish fellow was sent to Memorial Sloan Kettering either every year or every second year. Yeah. So I interviewed for that. Um, I gave a presentation. I, you know, did some special research, extra training, and uh, and was selected to to represent Ireland um, as an advanced fellow at Sloan Kettering, and and that's how I arrived here um, in 2013. And then and then ironically, I did my two year fellowship and became interested in immune related toxicity and immunotherapy for lung cancer. And, um, and met Julie Bramer, 
And she had re recently hired my colleague, Patrick Ford, who was my senior fellow in Ireland when I was just starting as a fellow. And, uh, and he was here starting as an attending and he said to me, you know, I think we would really love someone who's interested in IO toxicity at Hopkins. Why don't you come and interview? And that's how my journey to Hopkins began. And of course, Professor Kennedy has never been more delighted that I ended up at Hopkins after he told me back when I was 22 that that was the place to be. Well, that's really an amazing story. I'd like to turn then to, to the question of immunotherapy toxicities. And obviously, you have been there almost from the inception of immunotherapy and cancer, where so much of that research has been going on between Memorial and uh, Johns Hopkins. But at the same time, I think it's really interesting. You started a multidisciplinary immunotherapy toxicity management team or consult service also to assess which patients should or should not be candidates. Can you tell us about that, how it's been doing? And, and I'm also interested in how much the folks at Hopkins now regularly turn to and maybe even depend on a consult service versus kind of managing things themselves. Uh, yes, great. So you're right. I think I was, you know, the development of this concept and service really was a, um, a marriage of uh, great timing and interest. So when I was at Memorial, I worked between the lung cancer group and the phase one immunotherapy group, which is called the ITC. And in that concept, in that sort of clinic, I worked with Jed Walchok. And actually the first three patients that we saw all had or ended up having pneumonitis from checkpoint inhibitors. And so I think like many of us, my interest developed organically from seeing patients in the clinic and developing questions based on the patients that I saw. So in moving that interest to Hopkins, uh, obviously Judy Bramer was the lead in the lung cancer space and had, had seen similar patients. So it was sort of a marriage um, made in heaven between the two of us to come up with some unique questions and how we may go about that. So in terms of the iotoxicity group, how that originated was at the same time when I arrived at Hopkins, we started noticing patients developing uh, symptoms suggestive of inflammatory arthritis, which had never been described as a toxicity from immunotherapy at that time. So I developed a close collaboration with a rheumatologist called Laura Capelli and began to appreciate that really rheumatologists aren't just joint specialists, but they're specialists in autoimmunity. And that's really what we were seeing here. So together we we came up with the idea of formalizing this interaction between medicine and oncology and creating a system by which oncology providers could have access to a sort of high level group of medicine specialists who are really interested and engaged in the clinical and research focus of autoimmune toxicities from checkpoint inhibitors. And how we went about this is we sort of approached the um, the medicine specialties in which we were seeing these toxicities commonly and and sought out those folks who were really interested in this from a clinical and a research perspective and in some cases even encouraged young and bright fellows to develop their research interest in this and put together the idea of this um, toxicity team and then we we brought the idea to sort of senior Hopkins immunology and immunotherapy leadership and really brainstormed how we could make this work. And one of the central tenets that we, or the central factors that we identified as an issue was that many of these patients may present with toxicities at out of hours times or in remote areas. And we needed a facile way in which these patients could be funneled to those specialists who really had a lot of expertise. So we came up with an electronic referral platform where anybody in the cancer center could refer a patient to us using a sta standard electronic referral form. We somehow got our, our you know, 20 person strong group of toxicity team members to agree to be contactable on this electronic platform, really 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a pilot period. 
And during that pilot, we received nearly 120 referrals. And, uh, and this created sort of this groundswell of interest in the questions. And from there, you know, we published a number of papers. And I think more importantly, it supported the generation of biotoxicity leaders within medicine. So now we have a pulmonologist, his name is Karthik Suresh, who, who has an entire clinic of PD-1, pd one pneumonitis um, and has won a K award and other sort of um, awards to look at this question. My colleague Laura Capelli in rheumatology has also won a K award to look at inflammatory arthritis. Um, and I've won an, a young investigator award to look at some of these questions. So really, I think some of the strengths of this is that not only only is it approaching a complex problem in a unique way, but it's it's sort of stimulating and and developing leaders of the future in a new area that I think is going to be important to many of us in clinical practice. There's so much I want to cover here, but one is let's just go to the the broader question of whether, based on the data and your take on a focus on immunotherapy toxicity, there is compelling evidence that the patients who experience greater toxicity also do better on immunotherapy and have greater efficacy. Is that a fair conclusion or is this potentially a byproduct of just the guarantee bias of people who are on immunotherapy longer are more prone to experiencing toxicities on immunotherapy? Yeah, Jack, I think that's a really astute observation, and uh, I would agree with you. I'd say a little bit of A and a little bit of B. So I think, of course, many of the publications um, in this area are plagued by this sort of lead time bias, that patients who are doing well on immunotherapy appear to receive more doses of immunotherapy and then are more likely to develop immune-related toxicity. That's definitely a factor here. Um, having said that, we do see that certain toxicities are more common in those who are responding for longer. I think what we need to do from this is probably to look at this question in terms of each individual IRAE and to be a little bit smarter with how we do our survival analyses. So I would point you to a publication that myself and my pulmonary medicine colleague on the TOX team, Karthik Suresh, recently published in Clinical Lung Cancer, where we took our patients with um, lung cancer who developed pneumonitis and we analyzed this association between survival and IRAE in those patients and then in the larger cohort. And what we actually saw was that patients with, who developed pneumonitis had a lower survival, which stands to reason it's a potentially fatal toxicity. But we used a different method of survival analysis called um, Markov modeling, where uh, this is sort of a, a structured method of survival analysis where you take into account the risk of toxicity at different time points in someone's cancer journey. Um, so I think looking at these toxicity questions with different statistics statistical approaches, it's probably going to answer that question in a little bit more of a thoughtful manner. Now, taking the next step with the multidisciplinary model, I think one basic question that I have is, of course, immunotherapy, whether it's single agent PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, or potentially combinations now more and more. One concern I have is that if the folks at Hopkins who have been there from the beginning and have more experience with immunotherapy for cancer than just about anyone, if they need support from a specialized team, what does that say about practicing uh, immunotherapy by community oncologists who are 200 miles from a tertiary care center? Is it safe? Is it feasible? And I'm interested in your thoughts both for basically giving pembrolizumab, single agent, but also maybe especially nevo or something like that. Is this something that is going to or should be treated more like sending people for management of leukemia with a stem cell transplant and CAR-T to centers? Or is it safe enough that rank and file oncologists can have the knowledge and experience to safely manage these people out in the broader community? Well, I think at Hopkins, obviously, this is where a lot of the immunotherapy studies were originally done. And there are definitely providers here that are 100% adept with giving immunotherapy and all the toxicities that attend it. 
So I think what is interesting is the patterns of referrals that we see. You know, we're really only consulted for people who have complicated immune-related adverse events rather than the routine say thyroid dysfunction or um, skin toxicities and really those patients who might have say immune related adverse event overlap syndromes myocarditis myasthenia myositis all of these sort of complicated patients that really require people to put their heads together but i think also we do get referrals for maybe some of the more common questions by maybe some of the newer providers who are treating cancer types in which checkpoint inhibitors aren't something that they're routinely used to giving. And this sort of speaks to the continuum and the reach of immunotherapy across so many different cancer types now. And that dovetails nicely with your question as to whether oncologists in the community sort of are in a position to give these treatments safely. I think they're going to have to be. These treatments are now licensed in over 13 or 14 different cancer indications. I don't think we can think of this as, you know, the focus of, of giving a stem cell transplant where it's such a small group of patients that are, are going to need to be filtered to specialist uh, treatment centers. I think these treatments are out in the community. They're in so many different settings, and we're all going to need to create a system system by which we can safely manage these patients. But I do agree with you that that system is not going to be a one-size-fits-all for all different types and settings of oncology providers. So I think actually, you know, some of your interests, interests in telehealth, telemedicine, how do we leverage some of the uh, capabilities of, say, a multidisciplinary Hopkins IR talks team, maybe through a telehealth mechanism to community settings, maybe an initial first step. And then from there, creating maybe little satellite IR toxicity teams that community providers can refer to. I think those are probably ways that these sort of models will develop over time. And I think the second aspect to that is recognizing that this is an important new group of patients and encouraging the, the new generation of organ specialists to specialize in this area. So maybe partnering with, you know, cardiology societies, gastroenterology societies, pulmonary medicine societies to encourage their fellows to reach out to oncology and to, to develop training schemes for ICI toxicity so that we can create these specialists in local areas. This is something that will take a long time, but I think is probably the future of this field. Yeah, I certainly agree that giving pembrolizumab is not CAR-T or a stem cell transplant, obviously. But the challenge is that most of the time, very often things go smoothly, patients tolerate it extremely well, but the toxicities can be severe and they're rather idiosyncratic. And I think that is even more so when you're talking about IO combinations. Do you agree with that assessment that, you know, I think that the the challenge is we all have plenty of experience managing chemo-based toxicities over decades generally, and we know what to expect, but immunotherapy is, is really more capricious, I would say. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think the patterns of toxicity that we see with some of the combinations appear to be either more severe or different. So we saw in lung cancer at Keynote 189 that the the toxicities that occurred from that combination were different to the monotherapy studies, a little bit more hepatitis, a little bit more renal abnormality, as opposed to the, the classic pneumonitis, thyroid, skin toxicity that we saw with the single agent checkpoint inhibitors. So I think we're basically going to have to create a mechanism by which community providers or those in a situation where they don't have an IR tox team at their fingertips can reach for a team such as ours to refer their patients to, to link in with for uh, advice about some of these idiosyncratic toxicities, because even though they are rare, they do happen. And when we're giving these treatments in 13 different cancer types and 15 or 16 different indications, the absolute numbers of patients who develop these toxicities will grow over time. I agree that there is really an appeal to applying a telemedicine remote consult type approach to the expert toxicity group management that uh, you have pioneered at Hopkins. 
But obviously that can't be done by just one or two centers serving an entire country or large region. Do you know if there are other institutions that are developing or have developed toxicity teams similar to what you've implemented at Hopkins? Yeah, so it's interesting. There, there are other institutions that have, have set this up, and each of those institutions, I think, have approached the problem slightly differently, um, which makes sense. So Massachusetts General has developed a severe immunotherapy complications inpatient service where uh, these patients are admitted and actually the sort of service is both a clinical and a translational goal. Um, so they you know, collect a whole range of biospecimens from these patients and they're doing, you know, high level analyses, including single cell RNA seq on some of these. And I think their approach is really going to pioneer some of the next generation of treatments and um, understanding of mechanism of toxicity. I think maybe some of the challenges of that approach is it may encourage hospitalization for toxicities that could potentially be managed in the outpatient setting, and it may only service one slice of the pie, but definitely something that is is interesting and is working very well for them. Another group that has looked at this has been the Cleveland Clinic, um, again pioneered by a rheumatologist, Len Calabresi. Um, and they have sort of um, a monthly meeting, like a like a tumor board style meeting, which we also sort of incorporate into our IR toxicity team. Um, and that has worked very well. They have a couple of publications on how having this sort of tumor board allows them to sit down and refine some of the diagnoses. I think maybe some of the challenges there are having a monthly meeting is probably, again, not going to service those those patients who need an opinion in real time. So again, that might that might be challenging from that perspective. And then Thomas Jefferson, led by a um, a medical oncologist, has developed sort of a, a clinical program where they write SOPs for IRAE management, and um, they potentially slot patients in for early clinic visits who are high risk or call in with a symptom that appears to be high risk for an IRAE. So I think lots of different institutions are trying to do this in their own way. And it will be interesting to see over the years what different models come to fruition and what appears to be maybe an approach that is most effective across the country. Right. And there are certainly some CME companies that have online tools and there are guidelines from various organizations, SITSI and, uh, you know, ASCO's guidelines for immunotherapy, toxicity management, uh, Julie Bramer, your colleague there is the lead author of that. And I think that's been one of the top downloaded articles from the JCO website for most of the last year or so. So I think that's rather telling that fortunately there are these resources if you don't have a team of specialists available to you. But I, I think that we really will need to contend with this. And you know, this is just something that oncologists certainly didn't enter the field knowing, but uh, are having to become more adept at rheumatology than they might have expected, as well as pulmonology issues and various other corners of, of medicine that were not historically the province of oncologists, but uh, immunotherapy touches all of them. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a return to the sort of multi-system approach that many of us in oncology are used to in some sense. You know, if someone develops a neurologic symptom, we automatically think brain metastases. But now we need to just broaden our differential a little bit and, and add a few other diagnoses onto that differential. And it, it will be a learning curve for all of us. I'm definitely fortunate that I entered the field at a time where this was something that I was learning and was new to me and I was interested in, but I appreciate for the practicing oncologist where this is new to them, it's quite a high bar. Right. And while I think the guidelines are excellent and comprehensive in, in many instances, there are circumstances in which you are going to need a specialist in their own right to help you decipher some of these complicated toxicities that cannot be encompassed within a guideline. So I think it will be interesting to see how some of these toxicity approaches grow over time. Now, in stage three lung cancer, dervalumab immunotherapy is well established as conferring a 
statistically and clinically significant survival benefit, and it's a standard of care. You have been at a couple of centers that have really led the field in neoadjuvant and potentially adjuvant therapies, uh, immunotherapy in early stage. And uh, that is not a standard of care now, but may well find its way. But of course, in earlier stage, you have patients who may already be cured. Of, that can happen in stage three as well. But especially when you move to earlier stage, you have more patients who may be cured without the immunotherapy, and you still have a small but real risk of significant immunotherapy toxicities, potentially long-lasting. How much or how little of a concern do you think it should be that immunotherapy can have these idiosyncratic and potentially serious toxicities in an early stage setting where, where a greater proportion of patients may be cured without this intervention? Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Jack, and thanks for bringing that up. So I think the, the neoadjuvant setting is interesting for a number of reasons, or, or early stage lung cancer is interesting for a number of reasons. So obviously, there's been a couple of publications and presentations on this, but really only a handful compared to the experience we have had of giving checkpoint inhibitors for metastatic disease. So from the neoadjuvant perspective, obviously, we had our New England Journal of Medicine publication, the lead author was of which which is my, my colleague Patrick Ford, looking at giving two doses of Nevo alone before surgery. And then uh, the group at MD Anderson have developed this um, as well by looking at giving either Nevo or Ipinevo neoadjuvantly in their NeoStar study. And now they've expanded that study to look at Ipinevo plus chemo or Nevo plus chemo in two additional arms. I think there are a number of scientific advances that this approach can bring us. Firstly, it gives us a window into the tumor and a window into understanding what is happening within the tumor microenvironment from immunotherapy because we're able to get biopsies beforehand and resect the entire tumor specimen at the time of surgery. So scientifically, I think that this is definitely the way forward in helping us to refine what approaches may be beneficial or understand just what is going on immunologically in lung cancer. From a clinical perspective as to how this is going to apply in a real world setting in lung cancer, I think that's a completely different question. So I agree with you that there are some patients that are cured of their, their lung cancer just with straight adjuvant therapy. Um, and really that points to sort of the other area of advancement, I think, this idea of cell-free DNA, detectable cell-free DNA, the use of an MRD score that we're so used to in hematologic malignancies and how this may now be coming to fruition in solid tumors such as lung cancer. And I think that's really where the genomics and the immunology fields might converge in helping us to put forward, you know, the scientific advances we see from neoadjuvant immunotherapy with the scientific and clinical advances we see from cell-free DNA and coming up with a wise approach to applying immunotherapy either adjuvantly or neoadjuvantly in those patients who are deemed high risk for recurrence. Um, and in, in a smart way, that sort of says, well, we think you are high risk. And in a neoadjuvant setting, we thought that this particular marker was upregulated. I think the cell for DNA alone is probably not going to be the answer. This may be incorporated with some sort of a T cell marker that allows you to see what immunotherapy you may want to give. So I think we're a long way from getting there. But the fact that Duvalimab has entered the clinic for stage three lung cancer, I think is very heartening. And hopefully, we will be able to apply these new technologies to advance the field in the next, you know, five to 10 years and hopefully sooner. Well, I would say that one of the most gratifying things about immunotherapy and cancer is the sense that we are making these ongoing advances every few months and a sense that we have not come close to plumbing the depths of what we can do, that this is just a new dimension of cancer care that we are still babes in the woods about. And that we will, I hope, become far more experienced and knowledgeable about identifying which patients are or are less likely to benefit from immunotherapy at all or how we might prime 
the immune system to work in patients in whom it has failed thus far, as well as which patients can stop immunotherapy. And, you know, we have people on it sometimes indefinitely because we just don't know. But we're going to learn so much more over the coming years and uh, really more than we could possibly explore right now. So thank you so much, Jerushka, for taking the time. We'll have a lot more to talk about. Uh, This is still a story being written, and I think it's great work you're doing. So thank you. I look forward to catching you at uh, ASCO and other meetings. Take care. Thank you so much, Jack. Chat soon. Thanks for listening. The West Wind Podcast is a Beacon Medical Interchange production with sound engineering and distribution by Mark Lindsay of Talking Speaker. We hope you'll be motivated to subscribe, whether at beaconmedic.com, through iTunes, or through another podcast service. Please also rate it, and I hope you'll be inclined to tell friends and colleagues in real life and on social media. We're always happy to get your suggestions and other input at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. Talk to you again soon.